Hey folks, it's time for another uh, Jungle Drums. Um, first off, we had a wonderful live show as usual on Mixer um, at thurs on Thursday at 9pm UK time. Um, great show, the Scholarly Gamer tuned in, Mr. Creature tuned in, we had some feedback. Overall, you know, it was excellent. Unfortunately, it was too good of a show it would seem that um, Mixer fumbled up the VOD. Um, if you go to my, 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 my Mixer page, you know, it has the title Jungle Drums Episode 21, you click on it, and instead you get footage of Siege from like a week and a half ago. Um, so unfortunately, I am re-recording this locally, and I do not have um, my guests that were on last night. I really, really apologize. Um, the show was, was great, it was cracking, um, but it's lost into the ether. Um, so there we go. So you're just going to have to settle for me on my own, trying to recreate the magic that was last night. Right, so let's just jump straight into it, shall we? The uh, the first article is from a site, and you're going to love this name, Money Badger. Um, <laughs> it's under the uh, Stock Twits uh, network. Um, as you can imagine, Money Badger is a financial site. Um, and so this is about Razer. Um, Razer, the video game company that doesn't make games, is going public. Yeah, that's right. Um, Razer is, well, you know, a company that is based out of California, um, but they are going to make their stock available, um, you know, purchase on the market on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Now, there's a few reasons for why they've chosen the Hong Kong Stock Exchange rather than the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. Um, one being primarily, well, look, you know, they actually originated from Singapore. So technically, that is kind of their, their home market. Um, but to really kind of get a, an understanding of why they're doing that, um, let's give you a little bit of background, right? I mean, the video game industry is huge. Um, last year, in 2016, developers and publishers took in a whopping 99.6 billion US dollars. Um, and most analysts say that, look, for 2017, it's going to be over 100, over 100 billion US dollars. Um, quite amazing, especially when you compare that to Hollywood. Well, I say Hollywood, but the film industry. The film industry made a paltry 38.6 billion um, in 2016. So that gives you an idea of how big the video game, you know, medium is. I mean, if anything, for this generation of, um, you know of tech heads, of gamers and whatnot. I mean, gaming is the preferred medium for content as opposed to movies and, and television. Um, and don't even get me started on the music world. We all love music, but their numbers are just even smaller. Um, but the games industry isn't just made up of game makers. No, that's where companies like Razer are. You know, I mean, Razer makes some pretty badass accessories. You know, there's a lot of RGB, which, hey, you know me, I like my RGB. Um, you know, there's all sorts of um, equipment that they make, all sorts of accessories. Um, you know, and Razer's been on the scene for quite some time. I mean, 12 years they've been on the scene. Um, you know, so it makes sense that, hey, you know, they're going public and you'll have a chance to invest in them you know, as long as you have a broker that is capable of international uh, international trading. Um, so some of the taglines here is that, look, you know, Razer wants to raise money to make more products. Um, analysts kind of forecast that Razer will, will raise anywhere between 400 to 600 million dollars by going public. You know, this money is going to help them produce more goods, cut costs on their current products and possibly future products, and also it's going to enable them to expand their international reach. Um, you know, the company is already starting to dive into the console market. They've made some pretty cool arcade sticks, cool controllers, uh, console-specific headsets. Um, you know, so they are definitely trying to expand their reach. But one of the big things that Razer is trying to do is it's trying to penetrate the esports market. Um, esports is uh, is growing. Um, again, analysts expect that the esports related revenue is going to exceed 1.5 billion dollars by 2020. Um, you know, so by raising enough money and expanding, Razer hopes to put themselves in a position um, where they're going to be able to capitalize on that growth and become an industry leader in the space, which makes sense. I mean, already you look at a lot of tournaments, 
and events and you'll see Razer products all over the place sponsored by Razer, Razer this. Um, so it's quite quite interesting. Um, one of the reasons that they're going with the Hong Kong Stock Exchange is actually tied directly into esports. If you think about it, um, you know, the esports industry in Southeast Asia is huge. Um, you know, when it comes to actual esports, the Asian market makes up most of the demand. Um, if you think about it in the West, it's only been in recent years the esports has became really, really popular. Whereas I know firsthand, I used to live in South Korea uh, from what about 03 to 07, 08, and even back then, when I first got there, you know, and you saw these huge StarCraft tournaments, and the the kids, I say kids, but you know, the young people that were playing in these tournaments were treated like rock stars. You know, with young girls just swooning and screaming, you know, and fainting. It was a, it was quite amazing to watch. Um, so, you know, they've clearly got a good plan. They've clearly got good reasons for wanting to do this. <coughs> but the question is, is that honestly what's happening? Because if we have a little look at Razor's figures, um, you know, and this is the problem. Much is the case with tech-focused stocks. You know, these companies aren't necessarily always profitable. Now, I know what you're saying to yourself. Razor, well, they make top-notch quality gear. And it's quite expensive, and you're absolutely right. It is. It's AAA stuff. Um, but to put this in perspective, the uh, the last time they made a profit was in 2014, and they made a profit of 20.3 million, right? And they've lost money ever since. For example, last year they made a um, 392.1 million in revenue, right? So that's gross, right? That's how much they they brought in. But they actually lost, at the end of the year, you know, when you, you balance up your, your sheets, your your debits and your credits, they actually lost $59.6 million. Um, now, to play devil's advocate, Razer did buy a lot of companies in the last few years, including um, THX, you know, the George Lucas company. Um, but it just makes you wonder, is, is that one of their big reasons for going public? Is this a company that is actually bleeding money, which according to the figures it has been for the last three, four years, um, is going public a way for Razer to try to actually, you know, raise a bit of money in order to streamline their business and hopefully become profitable? I don't know. Only time will tell. Um, it'll be interesting to see what kind of price we're looking at for these stocks. Um, again, there's no info on that. And there's no info on exactly when the company's going public, um, but we'll keep a lookout for it, and hopefully it'll be, um, you know, decent and worth buying. <laughs> right, our next bit of news is um, considered well to do with the PlayStation. Um, now I'm not sure if you noticed this. This was earlier, much earlier in the week, um, and it was to do with the game Anthem. Right, Anthem. Not much is known about it. The game looks absolutely amazing. Um, and obviously it was featured quite heavily at E3, where um, during the Microsoft conference, you know, they, they showed it running on the Xbox One X. Um, well, this week, PlayStation um, had put up footage on their official YouTube channel. And fans were, oh, you know, they were so happy. It was great. Oh, look, finally we're getting to see some PlayStation footage. Um, but that excitement didn't last too long. Um, some eagle-eyed fans, you know, looked very, very closely, and they were able to see that actually the PlayStation YouTube channel was hosting Xbox One X Anthem footage with Photoshopped buttons. Uh, this report is from Eurogamer.net, and if I bring up this image here, you can see that it's got the PlayStation controls, but if you look closely, you can see underneath, or behind even, the original Xbox controls. Um, quite amazing. Uh, I mean, the video has now subsequently been removed, but you know, initially it was just, the, the internet just blew up with people saying, oh my God, you know, what is going on here? I mean, how does this even happen? Is this a case of Sony approaching, you know, Electronic Arts and saying, hey, um, yeah, can we get some love here? We need some footage. We want to be able to show our fans how Anthem's running on the PS4 Pro. You know, did 
the actual devs of Anthem give them this footage, say, oh, oh, here you go. Or was it a conversation that went something like this, where the Anthem devs go, well, actually, look, you know, we don't have anything yet, we're not quite there in, in the development cycle, or mm, we're having some issues, and then Sony themselves decided, hmm, well, we've got to do something. Right, hey, Bob, you're good with Photoshop. Can you uh, work something up for us? You know, who knows? The, the, the thing is, though, because it was the official PlayStation YouTube, obviously a decision has been made somewhere in the chain of command. It's not like this just happened. It's not like someone just trolled them and put this footage up. It was obviously a corporate decision somewhere, but whether it was on Sony's side or Anthem's side, I honestly don't know. Um, it's a bit of a shame because, you know, the thing is, it's not... The problem is, trying to pass off that console's footage as your own generates a lot of problems. Because, you know, obviously they're keen, they want to show, hey look, you know, the game's coming to PlayStation 4, we want to show how it runs, but by taking footage from another console, another console which as far as we know is, you know, quite a bit more powerful, things are probably going to look better on it. You know, you're doing your fans and your, your customers a disservice because you're showing them footage that's not necessarily representative of how it will be on, you know, on the PlayStation 4 Pro. I have no ill will towards PlayStation. You know, I'm not a fanboy. Yes, I have an Xbox. Yes, I play on PC. But, you know, I love all the platforms. I just hope that, you know, the PlayStation 4 Pro version of Anthem is good. You know, I think... Sony customers deserve a good experience and um, it's just a shame to see that this is the way things have went with that, um, that video so anyway like I said the actual original video itself is gone but if you look around the internet no doubt you'll be able to find um, still some remnants on social media of uh, some of the funny stuff that's occurred Speaking of PlayStation, my next article is from Daily Star, uh, which is a, a newspaper, well, it attempts to be a newspaper over here in the UK, and this is um, about the PS5. PS5 is coming, Sony confirms, and it could possibly have a 2018 release date. Right, so what happened was this, basically. Um, Sean Layden, who is the CEO and president, yeah, president and CEO of Sony Entertainment Interactive of America. I think I got that right. Uh, it's quite a, quite a mouthful. Um, anyway, he was doing an interview with a German tech site called Gollum. And um, I, I don't know how this came about, but he absolutely said, he said, look, a PS5 is coming. And it'll probably be some time before it's released. Um, and it's quite interesting because that revelation came, um, it was only what I think a day before another industry expert you know was claiming that Sony were getting ready to release a PS5 as early as 2018 um, this uh, expert was actually in an interview with the Wall Street Journal um, you know saying that hey look Sony's successor to the PS4 could be released during the second half of next year I think that's a bit optimistic but then again you know we didn't hear anything this year at E3. I mean, this year the focus was games. And this E3, if there was a PS5 in the horizon, would have been probably a good time to fight back because of the One X and, you know, how much focus that got. Um, but that being said, you know, who knows? The, the chances are if it was coming out next year, we would hear something this year, like the, the later half of this year. Something's going to hype us up, get us excited. Um... But so anyway, a 2018 release date has been predicted. But what's interesting is, why? I mean, the PS4 Pro has not been out that terribly long. I mean, is this Sony acquiescing? Are they saying, yeah, you know, we realize the PS4 Pro just isn't enough. It doesn't quite cut it, especially now with the One X that's coming out. I mean, is this reactionary to the One X? Obviously, consoles aren't made overnight, so development of the PlayStation 5 has been ongoing for several years but of course so has the One X so maybe the PS5 and Scorpio you know began around the same time who knows um, it'll be interesting to see 
you know, what's going to happen. There's a rumor going around that Sony might, you know, um, use a model that's similar to smartphones with yearly refreshes instead of big generation leaps uh, after a couple of years. So, you know, this again, it's all rumor. The only thing that has been confirmed is that PS5 is coming, but we don't know when. Um, you know, maybe they're... I suppose it makes sense if they wait. Xbox One X comes out this year. They give that a year to kind of settle down, see how it goes, learn from it, and then launch the PS5. Um, you know, but on the other hand, the PS4 is doing so well right now. It's a very popular system. It's still outselling, you know, the other consoles. Why would you announce a PS5? You know, is the PS5 going to have a new generation of games? Is it going to take totally different games? Or is it going to be a system similar to the One X where you just plop your PS4 games in it and they run better and faster, but then there's going to be special games that are PS5 capable? Um, again, we have no information. We don't know. Um, it's just... It's interesting. It's, it's very, very, very interesting. And hopefully, um, you know we, the gamers, benefit from this hugely and get a really awesome console out of it. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll definitely keep an eye on that and see if we can get more information in the uh, the next few months. Maybe we'll get some actual concrete kind of previews of what we can expect from it. Um, excuse me, I got sniffles. Um, speaking of badass hardware, um, right, we know we've been talk we've talked about AMD and Jungle Drums several, several times. Um, you know, with the thread, well, back before the Ryzen's came out, we were talking about them, then they came out, then there was Thread Ripper on the Horizon, then of course the Vega cards, the Frontier Edition, which if you remember the Frontier Edition was quite a sexy looking card, but a professional grade video card. Um, you know, so it's not really for gaming. Now, there had been some benchmarks that had been leaked on the Frontier Edition, and they didn't look that great. So there was a lot of AMD naysayers saying, oh look, Vega, it's going to perform like crap, it's not that great. But, you know, that was a professional level card, not a gaming card. So that kind of makes sense. On one hand, you can argue that, oh no, wait a minute. It, you know, you can kind of get an idea of, you know, the architecture when you, you run these benchmarks on a professional card. But honestly, the gaming cards are the ones that have the special optimizations and, well, you know, are made for gaming. So, this next bit of news is from WCCF Tech, and it's to do with RX Vega. RX Vega is the gaming uh, version of these Vega cards. And um, some benchmarks have leaked, showing that it's ahead of a GTX 1080, and the specs have been confirmed. 1.6 GHz clock speed, 8 GB of HBM2 memory, and 484 GB a second of bandwidth. Right, so that's a lot of numbers, and it sounds interesting. Um, to put this in a perspective, there were some leaked benchmarks, I think a week or two ago, that had it performing worse than a 1070. So as you can imagine, the geek world w was just in an uproar, saying, what the hell, Vega was supposed to be this, it was supposed to be that, it was supposed to be the NVIDIA killer, and it can't even, you know, perform better than their, their kind of middle... Well, bottom the middle lower range card um well according to these benchmarks that is not the case um the the gaming version the rx vega has a 30 megahertz improvement over the frontier edition um and everything else is just you know it just looks um the stats are higher when it comes to um the um the gaming performance. Um, what they did was they used 3D Mark 11, and I'll just bring up a little chart here and I go really, really into it. And this is this is quite interesting, right? What they did was they took a, a reference 1080 Ti, right? The flagship gaming card from NVIDIA, the RX Vega, um, a Founders Edition GTX 1080, and then same, a Founders Edition GTX 1070. And so the graphic score in 3D Mark 11, as you can see, the 1080 Ti is at the top with 38,389. 
Then RX Vega came in second with 31,873. The 1080 is 27,000 and the 1070 is 23. So that's a nice little boost over the 1080. Um, you know, quite a decent amount of performance. Yes, it's nowhere near the, the 1080 Ti, but this raises the question for me of price. You know, if this card is the same or possibly even a little bit cheaper than a 1070, then this is an awesome deal. But if they price it aggressively and ex well, expensively, I mean, then I'm really not sure, you know, if this is going to hit the mark. Now, hopefully later down the line, we're going to get some mantle optimizations. You know, if you're using an AMD CPU and an AMD video card, um, AMD is well known for doing these driver optimizations um, where certain games will run much better on purely AMD systems. Um, so we'll have to see. Um, you know, obviously the lead that Vega has, that's just a benchmark. You know, that lead could shrink in real world gaming tests depending on the game. As we know, there's lots of different games out there and they all scale quite differently. Um, but what was interesting was this update that WCCF Tech did, um, and they did some of their own in-house testing using 1080s and 1070s um, at clock speeds, uh, I mean at stock clock speeds, and then also at overclocked speeds. So the RX Vega had that score of just about 32,000. Right, and the stock was 27. Well, WCCF Tech, when they did their testing, they got a score of 28,000, well, 28,500 for stock. Um, but when they overclocked the card, they got 30,500. That's only a difference of 1,300 points. Um, I've got the little graphic here, um, where so there's the 1080 stock, 28, and then overclocked up to 30. You know, so that's quite a different um, from what the uh, the benchmark results had leaked. And then same with the 1070, there's not much of an increase here, but stock speed's 23, 343, so that puts in the margin of error as the original one. But when they overclocked it, they got up to 25. So if you look at overclocking these cards, you know, the lead that Vega has, again, these are just leaks, so we don't know 100% for sure, but it doesn't have as much of a lead as we hoped, which is a bit frustrating, a bit disappointing. You know, it's not that we wanted Vega to come in and stomp everything and wipe the floor with NVIDIA, but it was more about trying to be competitive, you know, to actually try to drive the prices down, you know, to make NVIDIA push themselves a little bit, because if we're honest, NVIDIA's had quite an easy time for the last few years. They just can make a card and go, okay, right, we'll make one a little bit better, We'll put RGB on it or, you know, flashy lights. Oh, we'll put a TI after the name. Um, and we were hoping that AMD's new Vega cards were actually going to put a bit of pressure on them. Um, to be fair, they are, depending on how they price them. If they try to price this competitively against the 1070, then they are definitely on a winner because it does. It scores significantly higher than the 1070. Whereas if they're putting in the price range of the 1080, I don't know that's necessarily going to be a hit. But then again, these arguments could all be moot because you can't even buy an AMD card these days. Have a look online and try to get an RX 580, an RX 570, and you'll be lucky if you can. Just yesterday, Newegg had five eight, uh, 570s in stock, I think for like a whole two minutes, and then they disappeared. And that's, of course, because of the Ethereum rush at the moment, the, uh, the mining for cryptocurrency. Radeon cards do an amazing job at this and so they're all sold out. That's right gaming cards are not in the hands of gamers at the moment It's all these miners that they're getting them and um, that makes us sad pandas It's gotten so bad that now the Nvidia cards are starting to get eaten up as well uh, The 1070 scales really well. It's a nice compromise between price and performance um, And it'll do a decent job of mining cryptocurrency so I just hope that that all quietens down by the time Vega comes out. Because um, it'd be nice to see this card in the hands of actual gamers. And hopefully they can uh, do, um, do some damage with it. Uh, speaking of gaming, there's one game that I've enjoyed since launch. And, you know, the launch of it was a bit rocky. 
it's it's not been perfect it had potential but over the you know over time it has gotten better and that is tom clancy's the division um so i've got just a quick little article here from wccf tech and it's talking about update 1.7 um update 1.7 is going to allow players to recustomize their characters Yes, one of the biggest asks of the community was that ability to customize their character. Because so many folk did it. Day one, they made a character, they put some cool sunglasses or whatever on him, or her, and then they started playing the game, they're like, oh man, no, I don't like the sunglasses, I've got some really cool armor, I want to show it off, and you take, take those sunglasses off, and they can't. Um, it's been a huge thorn in the side of most Division players. Um, so 1.7, which is currently on the public test servers as we speak, um, should be coming, be released hopefully in the next week or two. Um, one of the features it has is recustomization. Um, basically, if you're familiar with the division and you know where uh, the BOP, well, the BOO, the base of operations is, and you know where the hub is that goes down to the underground, right? Well, once you go from the base of operations down towards the hub, as soon as you get into the hub, you take a right, right? There's now a new door that goes upstairs, and you find yourself in a little locker room area. It looks like a bathroom, just without any toilets, right? It's got sinks, it's got mirrors, it's got lockers. And sure enough, you go up to the mirror, you can interact, you can change, you know, all of your features. You can't change your gender. No, there is no gender reassignments occurring in the, the changing room of the... Um, of the hub but at least you can get you know some plastic surgery and whatnot and uh, change you know dye your hair and things um so that's a cool little feature that people have really been asking for um but that's not all that 1.7 is bringing to the table 1.7 is also going to bring um commendations now commendations are like in-game achievements but they're tiered so imagine for example how many folk out there have you know shut a door in the division right you lean up against the car the door shuts you know we've all done it whether accidentally or purposely and um what these commendations are going to do is going to have these tiered objectives so like tier one might be close 20 doors so you're like cool so you do that and then you get like this little you know little pop-up telling you that you've done that but then the next tier might be close 50 doors close a hundred doors so on and so forth and there's going to be commendations for all sorts of activities you know probably killing rikers doing stuff in a dark zone probably underground stuff pvp things survival right whole lot of things that are coming um, with these commendations but what these commendations are going to do they're going to reward you with um customization items well i say customization items it's really only one item but they'll come in different flavors, and that is going to be a patch. A patch that you're going to be able to wear on your right shoulder. So that's quite cool. You know, something neat, and maybe there's some really difficult ones to get, and you'll be able to wear that commendation as a badge of honor. Um, so that's cool, right? That, that's something that's neat. Not necessarily game-changing, but it's, you know, it's given us more activities. It's given us something to do in the division. So that's always a good thing. Um... They've also discussed classified gear. Um, not too much is known about the classified gear, except that it's going to be pretty badass. It's going to, I think, have bonuses that you have to wear all six pieces to uh, achieve. And it's going to be rewarded through these new global events that are coming into game. Don't have that much information on the global events, only that... It sounds cool, and I want to do them. <laughs> That's about all I know. Um, so we'll just see. We'll see what happens with that. Um, one of the big rewards that's going to come from global events is yet another customization item, a vanity item. And that item is going to be masks. Yeah, I don't know what they look like. I would assume there's going to be all sorts of different ones. It'll probably be a clown one. You know, it'll be some kind of Michael one, hopefully. I mean, who knows? It depends on their licensing, but... But we're going to get masks, so that sounds quite cool. There's there's a lot of things that are coming in 1.7. I mean, as I said, it's on the public test server right now. And, um, you know, it's... Uh, the devs, you know, massive. They're trying to improve the game. Later on in the year, we're supposed to be getting a little bit more content, some more story-based stuff. Um, so we'll just have to see. Hopefully they, they deliver. And, but either way, I know me and my friends will be diving into the division once 1.7 hits. At least just look around and 
and see what's on offer. Um, right, continuing with games, um, what's happened quite recently and is interesting is over in China. Um, I'm not sure if you remember, we did talk about it before, um, but China had uh, introduced legislation, legislation even. Sorry, I see, I need more coffee. Let, let's get a sip of coffee. Ah, right, that's better. They'd introduced legislation um, that basically kind of treated games with loot boxes as a form of gambling, and therefore game companies had to release the odds of getting items. So Blizzard had to do it with Overwatch. There's no doubt Heroes of the Storm is going to have to do it. There's been several games in China that have had to release their drop rates. Um, so the latest to actually comply with this, I don't know if they were told they have to, but I think it's just a case of them trying to preempt it. And that's been Digital Extremes with Warframe. Um, this is from PC Gamer. And Digital Extremes has revealed the Warframe drop rates. Um, now, it's really quite amazing. Um, if you've played Warframe, if you haven't, you should pick up. It's free to play. Um, Warframe has evolved over the years. At launch, it was a bit rough around the edges. It wasn't great. It was quite frustrating. But over time, it's been refined. Um, me and my gang, we still play it. Not as regularly as we should, um, but it is a really, really fun game. Um, anyone can pick it up when you get into like the advanced features of it, you know, doing like your min-max building, um, it can just get absolutely ridiculously crazy. But of course the game is a looter shooter where you're trying to collect things, you're trying to build things, so drop rates are quite a big deal. Now, there's always been drop rates available via the, um, the Warframe wiki because they basically data mined the information. We never knew if it was 100% accurate or not, um, but you know, that information has been kind of there for a lot of items. Now, I say a lot of items, but what they have released, if I pull this up real quick, right, now you can see over here on the right, the little, um, you know, the, the, the scroll bar that shows how far down I am. And if I just start scrolling, and scrolling, you can see that um, I'm not making <laughs> much progress. They have released drop rates for everything in the game. I mean, it is honestly ridiculous, the level of detail that they have went into. Um, and it's quite interesting because this allows people to see, you know, exactly how rare some items are. Um, I mean, basically, you know, there's some items that have a 0.09% drop rate, um, which, you know, they're kind of considered beyond legendary. I mean, just think about how many times you would have to do an activity to possibly realize um, one of those items. I mean, one of the big ones I can think of is um, anyone who's, you know, had to fight the Stalker. And we know the Stalker can drop the War Blueprint, it can drop Dread, it can drop Despair, and it can drop Hate. Well, War, yep, easy, yep, have had that. Dread, yep, had that as well. Even had a Hate. Uh, I think I've had a couple of Hates. Not Haters, but Hate. Um, but the, the throwing knives that he has, Despair, I don't think, none of my buddies have ever seen that drop. It just, it does doesn't occur very often. And then when you find out that Stalker actually only has a 50% chance of dropping anything to begin with, um, it just whew, it really puts things into perspective. Um, but no, it's quite interesting. I'd asked last night, I'd asked Gim, because Gim, Gim Boyd plays this game more than we do. Um, and I'd asked him, does this really change anything for you? Do these, you know, all these published uh, drop rates change the way you're going to approach, you know, farming things and whatnot. And he said for him it really didn't. That, you know, no, these numbers were already kind of available, and that's not how he plays anyway. You know, it's not like he specifically targets things that would get too boring for him. He just plays to enjoy the game, and if he gets loot along the way, bonus. So, fair enough, Kim. You know, thanks for your input there. It was interesting. Um, so, yeah, so there you go, Warframe. Again, if you haven't played it, you should definitely give it a try. It's free to play, but I will say it is the most expensive free to play game because I found myself buying quite a bit of stuff. You know, they come out with these prime access packs and 
um, Prime accessory packs and a lot of them I just couldn't resist. Um, I haven't bought one in quite a while now. I've, I've, I've been able to, to uh, not touch the last few, but uh, at least initially when I did have quite a bit of dispensable income, I was just, I was blowing uh, money on that game something fierce. But anyway, it is, it's still a fun game. Sticking with PC Gamer, um, I've got a little bit of news from them. This is actually the last article of, uh, I would say the evening, because usually we do this in the evening, but because I'm re-recording this, it's actually daytime now. Um, and this is to do with Steam Link. Now, I don't know how many of you have used Steam Link. Um, I certainly have. I've got a really cool gaming tablet, right? And my gaming tablet, um, which funnily enough you can see about on my YouTube, um, basically allows me to play Xbox games. Xbox One games remotely, you know, from it. Um, it also allows me to connect to Steam. Um, so what I can do is if I've got my home PC on and Steam's open, I can open up Steam on my tablet and then run any of the games. Now what happens is the PC is actually the one running the game, but then it streams it to the tablet and then I can control the game from the tablet. So it's pretty nifty. Um, the Steam Link only works over the home network, so I'm sure there might be a way to do it out with, but probably it'd be a bit, ugh, probably it doesn't perform as well, whereas the Xbox uh, streaming you can actually use from a remote location. But again, it's very dependent on how your bandwidth is, both in your house and wherever you physically are. But so anyway, Steam Link's been around for a while, right? They've had these Steam Link boxes, they've got, you know, you can hook up Steam Link from a laptop if you want. If you want to be in the living room and fire up, you know, COD or um, wherever it is you crazy kids play. Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, right? Fire up in a laptop, use Steam Link, your home computer, the main desktop does all the work. Well, what's quite interesting is that Samsung has actually partnered up with Valve and they have this app in beta um, that is actually the Steam app, right? So that's cool, right? Basically, this app's in beta, and what it would mean is if with these Samsung TVs, you open up the, the Steam app, you plug a controller into the TV, directly into the USB port of the TV, and then there you go, you've got your Steam library in big picture mode, your computer's doing all the work in the other room, and you're able to play games from your, your television. So it sounds really, really, really quite cool. Um, and what's interesting though is obviously it's a beta app, so there's a few issues. For example, it says um, that um, the app only supports the Steam controller. So the reviewer, or well, the tester for this, sure enough, tried to plug in the Steam controller's wireless dongle into his TV, and it didn't didn't recognize it. Well, I'm sorry, it did recognize it, but it was only accepting one out of every ten inputs. So he tried changing the batteries, he tried doing, you know, everything he could. He could barely navigate the menus. So he got a bit frustrated with that and said, you know what, to hell with it. He grabbed a wired Xbox 360 controller, plugged it into the TV, Bob's your uncle, no problems whatsoever. Um, so sure enough, he tried gaming um, and he said, look, once it was in Steam big picture mode on his TV, he said the experience was identical to Steam streaming to any other device. He said he played about two hours of Hollow Knight, uh, the controls were snappy, he never suffered from lag or any kind of hitching. He did say he got a little bit of visual artifacting in one area, um, but that was most likely, you know, to his home network, you know, it was likely, you know, the, the streaming aspect of it. Um, but he tried a whole wealth of games, even Dark Souls 3, which he said ran flawlessly. Um, you know, obviously, he was um, playing at 1080p, 60 frames, um, but obviously these Samsung models also come in 4K, so it'd be interesting to see if you can um, use this on 4K, you know, if you can game in 4K, as long as your, your computer has the, uh, the ability to do so. Um, it's quite interesting. Again, the app is still in beta, so it can only hopefully get better. Um, but the the uh, the controller support is a little bit, you know, um, a little bit up in the air. Because, example, if you wanted to use the Xbox One controller, um, you would need the wireless PC dongle, right? But you're going to plug it into your TV, so your TV would need the proper driver. 
Um, so this is where the problem is going to be. You know, we're talking about plugging controllers well, and wireless dongles directly into the TV. So the TV has to be able to support that. Um, but, you know, the, the plus side is, there you go. You no longer need a living room PC, a home theater PC. You no longer need a Steam Link box or, you know, a, a console. You know, this is where I think this product is targeted at for those PC gamers who don't own a console but they want to be able to game in their living room um, I think having a smart TV that is Steam Link capable kind of solves that problem for them um, it's just a case of them getting their controllers sorted but of course what's you have to think about this is just on Samsung at the moment and just for selected models but hopefully you know it will actually kind of trickle its way down to all Samsung TVs and then, fingers crossed, if they get it to work flawlessly on Samsung, hey, what's to stop Valve from then going to Sony, going to LG, you know, so on and so forth. Um, hopefully we'll see what happens and we'll get some uh, some interesting results from it. I'm, I'm interested. I, I wouldn't buy it necessarily. I wouldn't buy a TV specifically just for that because, you know, I'm a console gamer and I've got other options available to me. But I can imagine, you know, if you're a hardcore PC gamer, you don't have a console in the house, um, having a TV with Steam Link available could be a, a, a decent deal for you. Um, right, well, that is all of the news for this evening. Again, I can only apologize that I've had to re-record this. Honestly, last night was great. It was myself, Sergeant J, Gim Boyd, as I said, Scholarly Gamer tuned in, Mr. Creature tuned in, who had some great feedback. Uh, some, some great comments and overall the show was brilliant and unfortunately I have had to re-record this because that VOD has went into the ether and this is just a pure, a pure shadow of the show that was last night but if you stuck in there and you watched it hey thank you so much for watching Jungle drumming on about gaming and tech news um, if you're watching this well obviously you're watching this on the site because this is where I've put it or you might be watching on YouTube um, you know hope you enjoyed the show make sure to like if you like dislike if you didn't please share embed you know do what you need to do tweet it out and uh check out our articles at scholarlygamers.com because every day you know it's like christmas for me I, I love just pulling up the site to see what articles next you know what is uh what kind of approach is someone taking to to something whether it's a review of a game or whether it's talking about the new gundam that's coming out or you know even just um, some of the health issues that we um, had an article about last week. Brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. Anyway, I'm Acute Jungle. I will see you next time for Jungle Drums. In the meantime, take it easy, folks. <laughs>